for me to thank the organizers and all, of course thank all those people who uh, decided to wake up one hour earlier to come here. Uh, it's actually uh, very helpful for me to go through this uh, argument and uh, work on presenting it in a, a reasonably self-contained way uh, and it will help us uh, too. So I, uh, I want to say that actually the paper uh, uh, with all this should be up, uh, up in a couple of days. So we can think of it as lecture notes uh, from this series. And uh, now uh, my goal today is basically to explain how a few things that I stated without proof are proved. Uh, uh, not uh, completely exhaustive list, of course. Uh, but just uh, I'll show some bits and illustrate some interesting methods uh, uh, which are not new by all means. So this is uh, mathematics which was well developed uh, uh, in uh, maybe 50 years ago or around that time. It's just new for me because I learned it recently. Uh, so, uh, so this is, uh, uh, I saved myself some time to uh, write down uh, the setup of today's uh, class, uh, and then I'll come back to uh, the point where I started, uh, Oppenheim conjecture and hinge and type theorems. So uh, I'm working with an arbitrary uh, closed subgroup of uh, a fine linear group. Gamma uh, is a stabilizer of integer points, and my assumption that it's a lattice in uh, this group. Uh, and uh, I'm willing to take any P inside Zn, which is gamma invariant. So we saw that uh, in the linear case, examples were either all non-zero vectors or all primitive vectors. There are two kind of interesting examples. Okay, and then X becomes the space of lattices, but not all lattices, but only lattices which are related to this G. Uh, so in the symplectic case, it's symplectic lattices, for example. In a fine case, it's a fine lattices. Uh, and uh, because of uh, gamma invariance, uh, we can define lambda sub p, so something like primitive points of lambda. And the main object is the Ziegel transform, which is uh, uh, which to a function on uh, Rn associates a function on uh, uh, the space of lattices x. And then uh, what I want to do is I want to state uh, two axioms in terms of the Ziegel transform. And then I'll tell you why they are good, uh, what follows from them, and I'll also tell you uh, how you can get them in some, at least in some uh, special case. So uh, let me recall that uh, there was theorem, no, before theorem three, and I need definitions. So G is of P, Ziegel type uh, if uh, there exists a constant depending on P such that uh, for every f in L1 the integral of f hat d mu is the integral over R Rn f t m. So here mu is a uh, uh, G invariant measure of X, which are normalized to be the probability measure, and M is the back measure on Rn, uh, also suitably normalized. Of what? Here? And you, you need to see. Yes, thank you. So people actually are paying attention. That's great. Yes, so this C is, uh, uh, is here, this normalizing factor. Uh, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's not one. Uh, so, so this is uh, this is the uh, so this is the axiom. As a consequence, we know that f hat is in L one. This is some a byproduct of this. And then G is of P Rogers type. If there exists another constant d. Uh, such that uh, uh, f hat p minus c p. So c becomes uh, 
I guess, the standing assumption that we have this, and on top of it, we also have another property, uh, minus uh, Cp, uh, the integral of f, which is, and I can maybe write it as uh, the integral of f hat d mu, and then you have L2 norm is not bigger than d times the square root of L1 norm of f. Uh, so now this is, uh, this is what I stated, uh, and uh, I said that I, sh I wanted for every f in L2, uh, and this was a mistake actually. So I'm very happy that I'm giving a third lecture so I can correct my mistake. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the, the right condition is that if f is a characteristic function of a subset. Now, uh, I can tell you how I found this mistake. I tried to prove it and I couldn't. Uh, and then I realized that something is wrong. So what is wrong is very easy to see because this doesn't scale correctly. Uh, you can notice that if you multiply f by a million, uh, of course this will multi multiply by a million, but this will only multiply by a thousand. Uh, so whenever you have this, if you find a much bigger function, you'll fail, it'll fail. So you shouldn't really hope to prove this for any uh, rescaling, uh, any constant multiples of a function. I mean, that's something I uh, wanted to understand, uh, I mean, I uh, wanted to point out today. And so, uh, so this is uh, an important uh, uh, remark that, uh, that I should make. Of course, we write, like, we write it like this in the paper, but uh, yesterday I just saw that maybe it can be say, uh, simplified, but no. So, uh, in other words, uh, you can say that the integral of characteristic function of E is equal transformed minus Cp measure of E, L2 norm is bounded by D times measure of E to power one half. So this is, uh, this is my condition. Or if you want the square of L2 norm, which is the variance, uh, is bounded by some constant, which will be d squared times the measure of e. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, 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 this is the axiom. Uh, why, uh, uh, I mean, it's quite strong, right? Here we really wanted to, want to have it for every f. Here we want to have it for every set. So we need to work hard, apparently, to prove it. And uh, I'll talk about some cases uh, a bit later, but first let me uh, derive a consequence from this. And this was theorem number three. Uh, so I'll state it in a somewhat simpler way, which is actually the way we'll need it, and uh, there is no loss of generality, really. Uh, so assumption is that G is uh, of uh, P Ziegel and P, uh, just P Ziegel type. Uh, maybe part one, G is of P Ziegel. Uh, 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 okay, let, let me start by saying that, uh, that we have uh, a subset E of Rn, measurable, uh, part one, if G is of P Ziegel type. And the measure of E is finite, then uh, uh, the number of lambda sub P intersection with E is finite uh, for mu almost every lambda in X. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll draw a picture. Uh, M. And now if uh, G is uh, in addition G is of P Rogers type and measure of E is infinite. Uh, yes, M, uh, we have M and we have mu, right? So M is very important. We have two spaces. We have space Rn, and M is just Lebesgue measure. 
and we have the space of lattices. And we have a probability measure there and denoted by mu. Maybe I should, uh, should write it uh, here. Uh, okay. So, uh, so, uh, so this is my set E. It's very strange. I mean, I don't know anything about it. It's just measurable set. Maybe it's given by some hyperbolas. Maybe it's just scattered around. I have no uh, control. It's an arbitrary measurable set. That's the beauty of this method. Uh, it could, might as well stretch to infinity, and it might as well have finite measure. So if it has finite measure, uh, the conclusion is that uh, you count the number of uh, uh, integer points, not just integer, but in point, points in P. Of course, sometimes you might end up having infinitely many points, but it's very rare. It has, uh, it's an event of measure zero, okay? And conversely, if in addition G is like this, uh, measure of E is infinite, and uh, you define E sub T to be E intersection of this ball centered at zero radius T. Right, so now you're looking at uh, uh, this uh, family of balls. Uh, then uh, uh, this number, lambda P intersection E sub T divided by the measure of E sub T goes to one for mu almost every lambda. Okay, so there is a dichotomy. If uh, the set has finite measure, finitely many lattice points almost everywhere. If it's infinite, if the measure is infinite, infinitely many lattice points, and moreover, the count is right. Uh, moreover, with an error term. Yeah, uh, yes, 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 sure. Uh, goes to one over C, yes. Of course, that's, that's the density that you're getting. People are really paying attention, it's great. Okay, so, so, so we have the correct density, uh, and uh, we go to this correct density almost everywhere. In fact, uh, uh, I could uh, write this error term because uh, well, I almost explained yesterday that that's what we are getting in these circumstances, and that's really uh, something very closely related to the work of Schmidt, both the statement and the proof. Uh, but uh, I'm not bothering with an error term because uh, there's no way I can use it. Uh, because uh, this is a statement about lattices, and I want to transfer it to a statement about correlative forms, uh, and uh, there, a lot of information will be kind of washed out including an error term. And it's, it's a, an interesting problem of doing it more precisely for uh, quadratic forms or for the orbit of F. I mean, this is something that uh, uh, is very, it's a very interesting question. Uh, okay, so, uh, so first of all, I want to prove this theorem. And uh, as I warned you uh, yesterday, it's extremely elementary. Uh, it's basically an exercise in elementary uh, real analysis, first year. Uh, graduate students will be able to do it. So uh, let me quickly uh, read. So, so we have, uh, uh, so first of all, uh, this part should be completely obvious, right? So because uh, the, uh, if uh, uh, f is a characteristic function of E, then uh, F hat P is exactly the number of uh, lambda P in E, okay? And so if uh, the measure of E is finite, it means that F is in L1, so this uh, guy is in L1. Uh, uh, and so if it's in L1, it's finite almost everywhere, end of the proof. Uh, Uh, and uh, now for the, for the second part, uh, you look at, uh, uh, so let me define F big capital F sub T to be the Ziegel transform of characteristic function of E sub T. Okay. Uh, so then 
uh, the integral by, from the Ziegel type, it follows that the integral of F sub t is equal to uh, C times uh, measure of dt. Right? So this is still Ziegel type. Uh, And then uh, what does Rogers say? Rogers say that if you look at f sub t, you subtract m, uh, subtract the integral, which is c times measure of e t. And you take the L2 norm, so let me take the square of L2 norm. This is, be this is going to be bounded by d squared times the measure of e t. Uh, that's great. So uh, perhaps the only non-trivial uh, uh, part, step in the proof, is to divide both sides by uh, uh, m e t squared. So when you do it, you get exactly this uh, ratio, which is good. Uh, f uh, t divided by c m e t minus one. L2 norm squared is bounded by d squared uh, divided by, uh, uh, right, so I will also want c here, of course. So I get c squared m of et, right? So what do we have? We have the variance estimate. Variance is not so big and uh, as, uh, uh, was observed yesterday is some kind of concentration. It says that the random variable is concentrated near the mean, and uh, just by using Chebyshev, uh, what you get is uh, for every uh, for every epsilon, uh, uh, positive the measure of the set of lambdas such that uh, ft of lambda divided by c m e t minus one, this is bigger than epsilon, is uh, bounded by d squared, uh, c squared, m t, and then you have epsilon squared. Okay, so uh, if you want to be bigger than epsilon, the probability is less than this constant times Epsilon squared. Okay, fine. So now I have this uh, family of ETs. Uh, the measures, uh, so remember la uh, last time I stated in a more general way where I have a family of sets uh, such that they are nested. Uh, uh, the uh, union has infinite measure and the boundary has measure zero. So this is perfect, exactly what happens here. Okay, in particular, this M of ET is a continuous function. Uh, well, uh, at least I don't know where it starts, but it's, it starts at some point and it beca becomes continuous. Uh, so let me denote by t tk uh, uh, be such that measure of e tk is k squared. Just put k squared. So if this is the case, I put k here, and then we'll have k squared. So this, uh, uh, now we fix epsilon, and uh, we let k go to infinity. We have this estimate. What is good about this estimate? The sum is finite. Okay, uh, so uh, by Varel Cantelli lemma, we get that almost every lattice is only infinitely many of these things, right? So for every epsilon, almost every lattice is infinitely many. That's uh, what does it mean? It means that this ratio converges to one almost everywhere along this subsequence. So by, by Alcantelli, it follows that f t sub k uh, divided by c m e t k goes to one uh, almost everywhere. So it's already, uh, I mean, if you want uh, infinitely many solutions, we're done, right? We've found the subsequence. Okay. 
if you want to be really pushy and uh, get the convergence uh, along the whole sequence, uh, well, just for every t, that's not also not a problem. So what you write is, uh, 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 so now you take, uh, let me write here, to get it for t goes to infinity, uh, for every t, choose k, such that uh, t is between t k and t k plus 1. And then you write uh, f t uh, divided by uh, uh, f t divided by c times measure of e t. So let, let me bound it from this side. This is going to be f bounded by e k plus 1, right? And this is, uh, here I have to use TK because it's in the denominator, so it goes other way around, right? So this is the same as F TK plus 1 of lambda divided by C M E TK plus 1 times the uh, measure of E TK plus 1 divided by measure of E TK. But uh, this is great because this is just uh, uh, k uh, uh, plus one squared divided by k squared. Okay, so you let k go to infinity. This goes to one, and therefore this also goes to one. At least the lim soup goes to one, and then uh, similarly. You do the lower estimate. Okay, and that's let's uh, end the proof. So, so this proof actually uh, uh, you can uh, find it word word by word in, uh, for example, Dirac's book on probability theory. He has a theorem about quantitative Borel Cantelli. Uh, he's not using it exactly like this. There are there are slightly different assumptions, a bit stronger, but uh, the proof actually goes through exactly like this. Uh, so we're done. Yes, question? Okay, so that's that's all it takes. So as long as we have this nice uh, Rogers estimates, this uh, L2 method kicks in and we have convergence almost everywhere. Uh, okay, but this is, uh, I mean, now we have to pay the price because the, our assumption is really magnificent. Just for every set, no assumptions on the set whatsoever, we are able to do this. How, how, how can, is it possible? So let me state then theorem four, uh, which says that, uh, for example, SLN R has a, uh, is of P Ziegel and P Rogers type. Say P is Zn minus zero, and let me assume that N is uh, so here n is at least two, and here n is at least three. Okay, so uh, this is of course uh, very classical. Uh, this is exactly what is proved, what was proved by Ziegel, and this is exactly what was proved by Rogers. Uh, and uh, he had much more sophisticated methods, which I don't want to go through. Uh, but uh, well, since uh, it's a lecture course, let me indicate how. This is uh, done. Okay. Uh, so, uh, roof. Okay, any questions? Uh, uh, well, okay. Gamma is uh, somehow gamma is uh, uh, in for my conditions. They just pops out right away when you want to study integer points. If you, want to, if you start somewhere else, maybe you get something else. But if you start from integer points, your gamma is just a stabilizer of, of, uh, of your lattice here. OK? So uh, all right, so let me, let me talk about uh, the proof. And let, let me, of course, start with Ziegel property. Now, with the Ziegel property, there are actually two proofs. Uh, 
probably I mean, many people in the audience know the story. There is original proof uh, by Ziegel, uh, which basically uh, says the following, that uh, uh, you have, uh, okay, let me see what we're proving here. We're integrating Ziegel transform. Ziegel transform is a summation. So basically it's double integration. If it's double integration, it must come from some product measure and from Fubini theorem. So write it down, interchange the integral, you get exactly this. Uh, that's, uh, that's I mean, a short version of uh, this approach. And uh, it's very precise and it actually uh, proves, uh, by virtue of Fubini, it proves that the function is in L1. Uh, and uh, I uh, learned it uh, in my graduate school days from Serge Lang, who was giving course in SLNR and explained it very, in a very beautiful way. Without him, certainly I wouldn't go into this subject of Ziegel transforms. Uh, but there's also another proof, which is what I'll uh, 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 talk in a more detailed way. So it's kind of Fubini typed. And uh, so this is what you can find in Ziegel 1945. And another is uh, uh, connected with the name of Beach. Uh, who, uh, well, at least uh, the way the anecdote goes is that he was uh, listening to Margulis giving a talk about uh, their work with Alex and Shahar on quantitative Oppenheim conjecture on uh, up rounds and asymptotics, uh, where he defined the Eagle transform, and at some point, which stopped uh, listening, because he started thinking about the space of translation surfaces and why, why not define. Ziegel transform there, why not add up uh, some over settled connections? And then uh, in the process, he came up with his approach to Ziegel's formula. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it ended up in his papers and then papers of uh, uh, Eskin and Mazur and other people. So, what is uh, happening here? Uh, unfortunately, uh, for this proof to work, you actually need to prove that Ziegel transform is in L1 first. Uh, and uh, once you know it, it becomes some kind of uh, hand waving. So how, uh, how does it work? Uh, well, uh, in fact, even, even more uh, needs to be proved. Uh, uh, moreover, uh, the L1 norm of have head uh, is uh, bounded on compact subsets of uh, the space of continuous functions with compact support. Okay, so not only the L1 norm uh, is finite, but it's also uniform if you fix the support and fix the upper bound, you know, the C0 norm, the function. Okay, so, uh, so let's, let's, try, uh, let's try to prove it. So we have a function uh, on Rn, which somehow looks like this. Right? So it's some, some function like this. You want to uh, uh, add uh, to count uh, the, uh, to add the values over latest points. You know, my Rn, Rn is here. Okay, so it will only go up if you uh, replace uh, this function by a constant function with the same uh, upper bound, right? So you can just assume that F is uh, constant on the support. And it will only go up if you increase the support so that it becomes, uh, say, ball of radius, big radius. Okay, so it's enough just to show it uh, to take F, to take F, uh, which is characteristic function of ball set at and zero, of radius R and understand its Ziegel transform. Okay, well, now that, this is great because this is just counting lattice points in big ball. Something should be, we should be fine. Uh, but R, R can be arbitrary, so let me just pretend that R is equal to one. Uh, if R is big, uh, just a version of this will uh, just contribute by a constant depending on R, but that's, that's all. So if R is equal to one, now we have this uh, 
this ball. Uh, so now if, if our lattice is uh, your friend, like integer lattice or some kind of minor variation, then it's not a big deal, right? There are not so many lattice points. So we have to fight with the situations where there are much more lattice points than you would expect. Okay, when, when can it happen? Which lattices have a huge amount of lattice points? And what do you need to assume for this lattice? You need to have small success if you have, for example, you have small vector, right? So what could happen is that you have a, a vectors which pile up like this. Okay, then in other words, your lattice is away at the cost. Okay, but nevertheless, you need to prove the gravity, so you need to deal with those guys. Okay, so if this is, if this is the case, uh, then f hat uh, of lambda is uh, bounded from uh, below, uh, sorry, from above by one over the first minimum. So the minimum over all non-zero vectors of uh, the norm of V. Okay, so you have some bound, maybe up to a constant, so let's ignore this constant. Now, uh, the function, so you get this function, uh, given a lattice, you uh, consider the uh, maximum of one over norm of V, and this function has a very nice name. Uh, I don't know who, inv who invented this name, probably Margulis. It is alpha one of lambda. So these alpha functions are all over the place in uh, the proof. Uh, of quantitative Oppenheim, uh, but this is only one possibility. Another possibility is uh, that uh, you could have, maybe I can draw a picture like this. Now, uh, so, so maybe you have a plane and it's filled even denser by something, right? So in other words, you not just have one short vector by two short, but two short vectors. And then the lattice, uh, what is the number of lattice points? It's Basically, the area of cross-section, which is one for all practical purposes, divided uh, uh, by uh, the area of this small parallelogram. So what you get that uh, f of f hat is bounded by one over the minimum over v1, v2, linearly independent, uh, and then uh, norm of v1 exterior product with v2. And that's exactly alpha two of lambda. Okay. So, uh, and then you can do it in all dimensions. And then you take the worst case. So in the worst case, the conclusion is that uh, f hat of lambda is uh, not bigger than some constant depending on f, uh, which, uh, uh, in fact, it only depends on uh, r in this case. Uh, constant depending on R, uh, times alpha of lambda, where alpha is the maximum alpha one up to alpha and minus one. So this is this alpha function of Margulis, and we have this axiom, uh, this, uh, this inequality. Okay, so let me uh, write it again. Uh, uh, F hat of lambda is uh, bounded by the constant depending on, well, actually, the C0 norm of F and support of F times alpha of lambda. Okay, this is a, Eskin Margulis Moses called it Schmidt's lemma. For a very good reason, because it's in the paper of Schmidt. In fact, everything uh, I'm talking about is either done by Schmidt or could have been done by Schmidt. Maybe it refers to everything in this conference, I don't know. Anyway, so this is Schmidt's lemma. So all you need to uh, do is to uh, find out what happens with this alpha function. You have a very specific function. You just want to know how to integrate it, how it integrates. And this is some computation involving uh, coordinates on homogeneous space, uh, reduction theory. Uh, it's very explicit. It is, for example, done uh, in uh, again, the same paper of uh, Eskin Margulis Moses. And uh, the answer is that alpha belongs to LP uh, of X for all P less than N. 
not for p equal to n. All right, so I'm not sure if you proved this part there, uh, but uh, it's not important for us, or it will be important for us, but we're not going to use it anyway. So, uh, so what's, what's the bottom line? If p is equal to one, uh, we're fine, always. If p is equal to two, we have a problem with L2. So I excluded this part. Okay, so I proved the uh, uh, Ziegel property and I proved the L2 part of Rogers property. And now I want to proceed with proving this estimate and uh, uh, I want to do it uh, just in the which way. Okay, any questions? So first of all, I think we're making progress. Uh, okay, so uh, let me get rid of this proof now. Okay, so now we have step two. Uh, actually, no, we didn't prove Ziegel properties, I'm sorry. Only prove that it's an L1. So we need to come uh, to uh, uh, continue, but how do we continue? We know that uh, we are getting an L1 in a, a bounded way, and this basically means uh, this basically means that the, if we associate to f uh, the integral of f hat d mu, this becomes a bounded functional on the space of compactly supported continuous functions. Therefore, it comes with a measure. So, therefore, there exists a measure nu on Rn such that uh, the integral of characteristic uh, Ziegel transform of characteristic function with respect to mu is exactly measure, sorry, this measure nu of E. Okay, this is just this representation theorem. Uh, once you know this, uh, great uh, property of this measure is that it is invariant by S L and R. Okay, if you move this E by S L and R, it just means that you change variables in integration and you're done. So it's uh, G invariant. So we have a G invariant measure on, on Rn, and of course we know what they are. There are only two possibilities, either it's uh, stuck at zero or it's a Lebesgue measure on the whole space. So the conclusion is that uh, Nu is uh, C1 times delta measure at zero plus C2 times M. And now you have to understand what is, what is C1 and what is C2. And uh, this is easy because you just take test functions and see what happens. So if you take uh, E to be uh, Ball centered at uh, zero with very small radius, right? So you, you don't expect a lot of lattice points there. So if C1 is positive, you have a problem. It can't possibly work. So the, this implies that C1 is zero. And uh, now you take E to be ball of huge radius. And what happens if you count the lattice points in this ball? It should be the volume of the ball for most of the lattices. Right? Of course, not for all of them. There is some boundary effect, but if R is very big, uh, there is no, I mean, boundary effect will uh, disappear. So the conclusion is that C2 is one. And that's the end of proof. Of uh, Ziegel's formula. So, an argument for uh, So for J, uh, I mean, uh, no, well, it's, it's a possible argument, but there might be other, other ways to prove it. You can try to follow uh, this approach always. I mean, I didn't say that it's necessary. You can have, uh, in the, yeah, in, in this table, uh, the enters are filled by many different ways. Sometimes like this, uh, sometimes it's by uniqueness, uh, but for this, you have to know the integrability. So you have to do some work. 
for this. I mean, some, sometimes there, is a, there are direct approaches, just using coordinates and Fubini theorem to write down exactly the, what, what happened. So, for example, in this uh, Duby Kellner and Shuchang Yu paper, that's what they do for symplectic group. Uh, okay, so uh, can I move on to Rogers? This is interesting. Yes, Anish, question? No. So, okay, so, uh, so Rogers formula, we're almost done. Here, uh, so now, uh, uh, Rogers, we already know that F hat is in L2. This is good. Right, we did this already. We assumed n is bigger than 2. And then uh, uh, I want to uh, look at the L2 norm of, of this, which is uh, the integral of uh, the sum over non-zero vectors of f of v squared, uh, which is the same as the sum of uh, over all pairs of uh, f of u, f of v, right? So that's the type of uh, things, uh, type, type, type of uh, uh, the expression we need to fight. And uh, now uh, I will naturally split it into two different parts. One is when these guys are linearly independent, and the other one when they're proportional, because it matters. So it's the sum, uh, sorry, it's the integral sum over linearly independent f of u, f of v, d mu plus the sum where they are proportional. And uh, 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 now this, uh, when you have linear, in the linear independence, uh, the philosophy here is exactly the same as in Ziegel's proof that I go through. You uh, think of it as a bounded linear functional somewhere. Uh, you can uh, see the SLNR action. So you can uh, guess that it's a linear combination of invariant measures. You can guess the constant. And that's exactly what Rogers uh, did. But he did it in a concrete way. So the conclusion by Rogers that it converges to the integral f dm squared. Okay. In other words, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, this part coming out. Okay. So uh, let me just uh, uh, rephrase. Uh, so f here is characteristic function of uh, characteristic function of a set E, and this uh, Rogers property uh, just means uh, that uh, 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 that uh, f uh, squared. Uh, is not bigger than the integral of f squared plus something, right? Because the variance is the uh, integral of f squared minus the integral of f squared. So that's that's what we. So uh, I'm leaving the details to uh, you, but uh, this is the uh, the main term, and now for the uh, for this needed. Estimate, we just need to estimate uh, the, integral, the sum, the integral of the summation when in the case where these guys are proportional. So, uh, yeah, I think I still have time. To do it quickly. So, uh, the sum over proportional guys, uh, it is uh, going to be uh, the integral over x, and now you add uh, 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 sum over primitive vectors, and then you have the sum over k, and the sum over L from minus k to k, it will not, not zero, f of uh, kv, f of lv. 
this lists all possibilities when they become proportional. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, what uh, uh, and now here is where I use the fact that we have a, a, a characteristic function. It is bounded by uh, the same without f of lb. Just ignore this term, right? It's uh, less than one anyway. Uh, so uh, so let me just do it like this. Okay, uh, and uh, and now you start interchanging variables. So what you'll see uh, eventually is uh, is not bigger than actually maybe it's just equal to two, and then you put the summation over k in front. Uh, uh, now here there is no dependence on l, so this just contributes as k terms. So you get k uh, times. Uh, the sum over the in the primitive guys f of k v yes uh, yes yeah you also have f of k so you have k v and l v but f is not bigger than one, so oh, okay. this was the uh, the, uh, the case that I wanted to uh, run through quickly. So you have some some something like this. Uh, okay. So now uh, I guess you have to uh, deal with the primitive Ziegel transform for this. Uh, there is no way out. So you prove we prove that uh, uh, prove this for uh, for this, uh, but. Uh, uh, it actually follows for a primitive vectors with a zeta function, right? It's very easy, right? If you start with primitive vectors, you can rescale them, and the union gets everything. So at actually, uh, it's a, a primitive Ziegel with a C a primitive is a one over zeta of n. Okay, that's an easy consequence of this, or you can just prove it directly. Looking with primitive vector anyway. This is what we were getting here. So we're integrating this d mu. So we be, it becomes two over zeta of n, and then sum k, and then the integral over r n f sub k d mu. So f sub k is uh, the scaled version of f. Okay. So you have to apply a Ziegel's transform to each of these guys for fixed k. But this is easy because you know what this integral is. This integral is uh, uh, the integral of f divided by k to the n. And you're done. You have this nice constant. If n is equal to 2, it blows up. So you have to do something else. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, it shows already that uh, there is a version of uh, Rogers type for uh, instead of L2, you have LP where P is less than 2, and it works. And that's what basically Schmidt did. So that, that's, that's the end of the proof. Okay, we have this constant, D, uh, which uh, will give you what you want. I think it's very beautiful. Okay, so, uh, so I still have uh, uh, maybe... Uh, a few minutes to come back to quadratic <laughs> forms and the orbits of uh, uh, the orbits of a given function. Any questions before I start erasing? Uh, so now, uh, now we know all this. And uh, uh, we just need to uh, Use theorem three. And uh, of course, uh, I'm going back in time, so I'm, uh, I want to state theorem two again. Uh, so G is of P Ziegel and P Rogers type. 
f is from Rn to Rl, uh, subhomogeneous. And psi from R plus to R plus L, uh, regular and not increasing. All this is understood coordinate wise. Okay, I'll, I'll remind you what, what is this uh, uh, subhomogeneity. Uh, and then, uh, uh, in fact, uh, let me also have two parts. G is a P Ziegel type. Uh, and uh, uh, you have this AF psi, which, let me remind you, is the set of X in Rn such that absolute value of f of x is not bigger than psi of the norm of x. So this was, will be my set E, which I have in this picture. Uh, and if uh, the measure of AF psi is finite, then uh, f uh, composed with g is psi p approximable for almost every g. Okay, which just means that uh, what it should mean, that the number of p intersection with uh, a f composed with g psi is infinite. And uh, now you have P, Ziegel, and P Rogers, and M of F, F psi is now infinite, and the conclusion is uh, the other way around, F composed with G is uh, phi P is not here. So this was the theorem that I want to prove. Okay, so now, uh, I mean, it's clear what is going to happen. We take this first part and derive this first part, and we take this second part and derive the second part. So I only have time to do one thing, the other will be uh, similar. So let me choose this one, because it's easier. So proof of one. Okay, so uh, so you want uh, to have the number of v and p, uh, v and sorry, uh, v and uh, in p, such that uh, f of g v is bigger than is not bigger than psi of the norm of phi. So you want to this to be finite. Almost for almost every G. And that's not quite what we have here. Okay, so uh, so you can uh, uh, say that this is uh, the same as the number of V in lambda P, okay. Uh, so, lam, uh, so lambda is g z n, and now you have, uh, we can change variables, replace v by g v, and then it will be this, uh, such that f of v is uh, bounded by psi of the norm of g inverse v. Okay, so that's the tricky part, right? We, g is variable, and here you have uh, this uh, this thing uh, like, like like this, but uh, uh, now g is variable, but at least we can uh, uh, assign it to line some compact set. So let's say that g belongs to some compact set in G. Okay, and then because it's a, it's a norm, uh, uh, we can uh, bound it by. Uh, uh, and, be, and because, uh, uh, right, right, it is bounded by lambda of v and lambda p, such that 
absolute value of f of e is not bigger than psi of cv. Or some uh, uh, c, sorry, the norm of u. Okay, so there is some c which depends on the compact set because just because you have the uh, estimate for the operator norm. So, so we have to fight, fight uh, to, play, uh, to pay for it with this constant. Okay, and uh, 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 well, and now I want to use the regularity of psi because it's psi times some small number, so it is going to be bounded by uh, uh, well, first of all, we, we, we just, I'm just applying, uh, now, now I'm applying part one, but uh, with a set, uh, uh, so now, now my, I, my E is the set of X such that F of V is bounded by Psi of CV. And this C is given to me somehow, depending on the concept. So, uh, so this is finite if the measure of this set x such that f of x is less than a psi of cx is finite. Okay, and now uh, just uh, in the remaining two minutes, I'm using all. I want to use all my assumptions here. Okay, so first of all, I have f of uh, psi of cx. Uh, so if uh, this will uh, uh, this will follow if we know that uh, uh, the measure of x such that f of x is bounded by some big constant a times psi of the norm of x. Okay, so psi, uh, remember that psi uh, was something like this. You now you go from here to here, and you can increase. But the increase is bounded. So you have this A, which just depends on psi. Uh, sorry, on this compact subset. Okay, so uh, you can uh, uh, maybe put it here. One over a, and here is where you use subhomogeneity. So, so this is a, this is a regularity. And now, uh, so I don't have time to remind you what this. Subhomogeneity, but the point is that uh, uh, this uh, this is estimated from uh, below by f of something times x. Namely, uh, it is it is enough to prove that uh, the measure of uh, the set of x such that f of uh, one over a to power one over d x is bounded by function by this. Is finite. Okay, so I just put a inside, and it became even worse. So I want to know this. Okay, uh, great. But now uh, I use the monotonicity. In fact, by monotonicity I mean that if you make this argument smaller, it gets even worse. The function goes. So let me just. Uh, because of monotonicity, I can actually do this. Put it here. Okay, I'm rushing, but I hope you, you understand. So now, uh, now you have the same thing here and here. So this measure is just, this set is just a rescaled version of uh, the set that uh, I started with, right? My uh, E was uh, a psi, and so this happens if and only if the measure of E f psi is fine. That's, so, I mean, this, uh, this is really a, 
completely elementary manipulations using this, uh, these properties. And, and if you want to do the second part, uh, I still have it here. Uh, so basically, uh, so you can have some version of this. But then you'll have various constants depending on compact sets. I don't want to state it. We have it on the paper. But the bottom line is that from this statement, we definitely get uh, the conclusion that uh, uh, almost everywhere the number of solutions will be infinite. So this, I think, uh, fills the last detail that I wanted to fill. Okay, so yes, thank you very much. <laughs>